Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to sincerely apologise for all the IT issues. I'm here now. I'm Alison Stilley. I'm a consultant clinical oncologist in Edinburgh, and I've um, been uh, an oncology consultant now for 10 years. I've been in the field of oncology for about 18 years now. I'm just very pleased to, to get the opportunity to speak to you about the day in the life of an oncologist. Now, I appreciate time is of the premium, so I'm just going to go through this. Then the slides will be shared and you can access them afterwards because I'd be very keen to answer any questions you might have afterwards. So what is a clinical oncologist? I think that's a, a very good question. Lots of people don't know what it is, and including quite a lot of my colleagues in the hospital. So it's a specialist in the non-surgical management of patients with cancer. So I get to treat patients with both radiotherapy, both external beam radiotherapy and brachytherapy or internal radiotherapy and systemic anti-cancer therapy. And the systemic anti-cancer therapy really has increased dramatically even in the 10 years since I've been a consultant. We have access to chemotherapy, biological agents, hormone therapy and immunotherapy. And we often use a combination of both radiotherapy and chemotherapy and or systemic anti-cancer therapy in the management of our patients. And we work alongside our surgical colleagues because many of our patients have surgery as part of their patient pathway as well. Now, as most oncologists specialise in one or two sites, I specialise in the management of breast cancer and non-ovarian gynecological cancer, so cervical cancer, uterine cancer, vaginal cancer and vulval cancer. But I'm also very passionate about education. I've got a significant role in medical education, both undergraduate and postgraduate, and I'm the undergraduate lead for oncology. When I was an undergraduate, we had really no exposure to oncology, and I'm just really delighted that, that students now get exposed to this, this um, specialty, because no matter what field you eventually decide to go into in, in healthcare, we know that cancer is increasing in prevalence and you will come across patients who've had a previous or a current cancer diagnosis. And I'm just hopeful that I can share with you, I know there's a lot of healthcare professionals, medical students and aspiring medical students in the audience today, I can just share a bit with you about, about what I do. So what is a typical day? I think that's a very good question. Um, and how do students describe my role? So I, I asked the students um, last year how they would describe the role. I think they often have some trepidation about coming to oncology because people often see it as very sad. But, but what they found was it was an overwhelmingly friendly specialty. They thought it was exciting and rewarding, but also demanding and harrowing sometimes and a bit sad and challenging. And I think one of the, the, the great things about the specialty I work in is that we work as part of a team. So... Here is a picture of Edinburgh on a beautiful and um, sunny day. Sadly, it's not like that today. We've had thunderstorms and, and torrential rain today. But I feel very privileged to work at the Edinburgh Cancer Centre as part of a team. And at the core of the team is a multidisciplinary team. And that really is the, 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 the heart of the team and where we make the decisions for the patient. And from the multidisciplinary team, our, our work stems. So we might um, see patients in clinic and the radiotherapy treatment floor and the systemic anti-cancer treatment suite. We'll conduct ward rounds and all the admin associated with that. But there's lots of other things that, that we do, not just direct patient care, which makes us such a rewarding specialty. So a multidisciplinary team, you might not all be aware of what that is. It's a group of health professionals with expert knowledge who review cases and discuss treatment options for the individual patient. And that really is central and pivotal to my role. And um, there can be challenges associated with that. We've seen that in the last four months. We've had lots of IT issues, which I've already had outside the workplace today where we've had to perhaps not all be in the same room together. And sometimes you lose the nuances of face-to-face of -face consultation when you're doing that. And um, we work as a team to synergistically to, 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 to give the patient the best possible treatment and share decision-making is at the heart of that, not just the decision-making of the healthcare professionals, but also the patients um, depending on their, their um, medical comorbidities, their wishes and their, their uh, medical beliefs and their health beliefs. And in Edinburgh, we cover a very vast um, geographical area. You won't all be aware of um, the geography around um, Edinburgh, but Edinburgh is, is the heart of the, 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 the um, region. But we cover um, patients as far away as Stranraer, where you get the ferry over to, to Belfast, and down to the Scottish borders, Fife and the Heart Scotland, as well out to Heart Hill. And we assess patients in clinic and formulate appropriate treatment plans initiate treatment, assess response to treatment and manage toxicities. Now, I apologise, I'm going through this quite fast, but just for the, the, the benefit of time, all these slides will be available for you afterwards. So what is radiotherapy? Well, radiotherapy is the use of ionising radiation to control or kill cancer cells. And it can either be given with external beam radiotherapy, which is a conventional radiotherapy or brachytherapy. And it works by directly or indirectly interacting with cell DNA. And these interactions damage the DNA and can result in the cell kill of both malignant cells, which is fantastic, 
but also it can damage non-malignant cells, which causes this toxicities of radiotherapy, both in the short and in the long term. And this DNA damage can be a single or double-stranded break. Normal cells are damaged, but generally repair, whereas cancer cells don't have that ability to repair. And the radiotherapy that we give can be curative. So in the, the, the case of cervical cancer that's not operable, I give a combination of chemotherapy and radiotherapy to cure cancer. It can be given adjuvantly, and that means to reduce the risk of recurrence. And that's commonly what we give after breast conserving surgery or mastectomy in breast cancer patients to reduce the risk of recurrence. And it can also be given in the, in the palliative setting to help with symptoms such as brain metastasis, bone metastasis, fungating tumours. And I think you know, what makes it such an interesting day is that the, 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 the radiotherapy pathway is complex. It involves lots of healthcare professionals. You're never going to feel alone in oncology. So we start off by delineating what we want to treat. We then work with our colleagues in dissymmetry and physics to plan the treatment. We verify that the treatment that I've planned is what I'm giving. And then we deliver the treatment. And, it, you know, the team working comes back to this. It's a diverse group of um, healthcare professionals involved in planning and delivering the treatment. We do a lot of peer review and radiotherapy planning, particularly some of our more complex radical plans in cervical cancer, breast cancer. We get together as a group of oncologists and with physics and our trainees to review each other's plans and, and um, ensure that, you know, we're all um, working to very high standards. And also, I know there's lots of other um, healthcare professionals in the audience. There's a real extended role of therapeutic radiographers with an expanded role in radiotherapy planning. And this is just um, pictures of my colleagues that I took um, to, to share with you. So there's a CT scan um, um, where they, they, it's a, a wide bore CT scan where we plan the treatment. And there's my, my colleagues, my radiotherapy, my advanced radiotherapy practitioner colleagues there in the background um, planning the treatment. And in the bottom right hand corner, the physicists working away. And the target volume delineation is, is we, 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 what we call the gross tumour volume, the tumour that we can see, the clinical target volume, the tumor where we know there's microscopic disease, and then we have a margin around that for, for movement. And, and then the, you can see it starts off quite a small circle, but the actual treated volume is much larger. And here it just shows the importance of working with colleagues in radiology. We've got a CT scan showing a tumour, an MRI scan showing a tumour, and then the PET scan. And we fuse all those scans together so that we know that we are treating the microscopic disease that we can see. And here, the, the top picture of the CT scan, it just looks like a big um, homogeneous mass there. Very difficult to delineate where the tumour is because there's a tumour with collapse. And if you treated the whole of that lung area, it would be a very large volume of lung that you'd be treating with associated acute and late toxicities. But by using the PET scan, we can actually see where the active disease is and minimise the, the volume that we're treating. So really, radiotherapy is about delivering a tumoricidal dose of radiotherapy to a well-defined target volume and sparing the surrounding normal tissue. We want to get as even a dose distribution as possible, taking into account any previous radiotherapy and medical comorbidities. Think about the tolerance of normal tissues. Every tissue in the body has a tolerance to radiotherapy. Some, such as the bladder, are very tolerant of radiotherapy, whereas the ovaries are very exquisitely um, sensitive to radiotherapy. So we need to take that into account. We want to modify the beam to get as even a dose as possible, shield the normal structures. And we can use anything from a very simple beam arrangement, a single field going into the, the spine to treat metastatic core compression, to complex beam arrangements to treat tumours within the pelvis. And that the, the radiotherapy planning does, you know, is, is the, the, the it does take up quite some time in our, our treatment. And we often work together with radiologists and with our colleagues as well to plan the treatment. Palliative radiotherapy is something that can be very effective at helping patients who have fungating breast tumours to help dry them up, alleviate the pain that they're getting, and alleviate the secondary infections that can sometimes happen in this exposed flesh. And here is just a very simplistic um, radiotherapy, just this direct beam treating this area of cord compression here. And that can give um, significant benefit to these patients in a very um, quick period of time and help reduce the need for, for um, analgesia and reduce some of the toxicities related to analgesia. And here is a patient with an advanced um, vulval cancer. You can see here these very large lymph nodes in the inguinal region. Radiotherapy can help reduce the size of the nodes and reduce the risk of them fungating through the, through the skin. So that's palliative radiotherapy. Adjuvant or radical radiotherapy is more complex because in these patients we're giving radiotherapy to either cure treatment or reduce the risk of, of the cancer coming back. And in, in these patients, it's very important, as with all patients, it's very important to reduce the risk to the, the normal tissues to prevent any long-term sequelae from, from radiotherapy. This is a, a right side of breast cancer. You can see the dose distribution here 
is um, as homogenous as possible, we were very mindful of the effect of radiotherapy on the lung and on the heart in terms of long-term toxicities. This is a much more complicated pelvic tumour where we've got multiple um, radiotherapy fields coming through to deliver as, as homogenous a dose as possible and minimising the dose to the bowel and the bladder. So there's a lot of um, thought going into the treatment here. And how do we deliver the treatment? Well, the treatment is delivered directly through the skin to the tumour and is generated by a linear accelerator. So we, we, we um, work alongside our colleagues in radiotherapy, physicists, dosimetrists and the, the, the engineers as well, all of whom the treatment would be possible without them. And we use treatment planning software to control the size and shape of the beam. There's lots of lots of acronyms that use intensity modulated radiotherapy, field and field radiotherapy, image guided or gated radiotherapy. And this is a, a sort of a cartoon of the, the, these very large machines that um, deliver the radiotherapy to the patient. There's obviously no time for me in the, the context of this talk to go through how, how, how this generates the radiation, but that's, that's for another day. But what does it mean in practical terms for the patient? The, the patient wants to know how long is it going to take? Is it going to hurt? So it takes about 10 to 15 minutes. The team of therapeutic radiographers will position the patient to deliver the treatment. It's painless. They have to lie still and generally have to expose themselves in the area where their treatments. They'd have to take the clothes off in that area of treatment. Our patients are reviewed weekly by our nurse specialists and therapeutic radiographers and their treatment that they may get some side effects is, is managed. It depends on the site of the tumour, they can get some skin reactions, some nausea or altered bowels and sometimes a flare up of pain and often um, the medics might be called on to review patients as well. So radiotherapy is, you know, is, is the mainstay of my my day to day um, work. I think it's, it's, it's something that we work as a team and that's what I'm so passionate about with oncology. It's all about team working. Brachytherapy, I can um, pretend to be a, a surgeon for every Friday morning. I am going to theatre. This um, is a very multi-step complex um, procedure where patients are taken into theatre. They're given a general anaesthetic. They're examination, examined under anaesthesia. And then special applicators are inserted through the cervical laws into the endometrium to enable me to give a very high dose to the, the primary tumour in the cervix. We work um, alongside our radiographer specialists and gynaecologists as well, interpreting the MRI and CT imaging. Now this does look slightly barbaric, but you can see here the metal applicator is going into the uterus and there's a, a, a what we call the cervical, the, 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 the ring is nestled up close to the cervical tumour and it just allows us to give a very high dose of radiotherapy here. You can see that the, on the sagittal slice here, this very conformal dose, so the red is a hot dose of radiotherapy, the green cooler, the blue cooler itself, and you can see the dose is falling off very rapidly um, we're treating the bladder and the bowel and it just allows us to get a very high boost dose to the, the tumour itself. We can also use brachytherapy in prostate cancer as well and it, it's, it's um, delivered trans um, perineally into the prostate gland and allows us to give a very high dose of radiotherapy to the prostate and again minimise dose to the bowel and the bladder. And it's not, it's not possible for all patients with prostate cancer, there's certain um, criteria but it's, it's another, another treatment that we can offer. Systemic anti-cancer therapy is also at the heart of treatment and that can be a combination with radiotherapy or after surgery or before surgery of chemotherapy, immunotherapy, etc. Patients are assessed in clinic and consented to the treatment. Now the majority of the regimens that I use are given as an outpatient so we want the patients to be trying to have as normal a life as possible depending on how the toxicities allow that. The number of cycles varies between different tumours, different tumour sites, Patients are assessed before each treatment, and that's generally done in the, 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 the outpatient chemotherapy unit by either the, the medical team or the, the extended team. There's been a huge explosion in the number of treatments available, and that allows us, particularly in the palliative setting, to offer further lines of treatment to patients who have progressed on first or second line treatment, and the importance of you know managing these patients, managing the toxicities, and finding the right treatment for the patient depending on their previous ongoing toxicities, medical comorbidities, etc. Inpatient workload, the majority of oncology work is thankfully um, outpatient based. Most patients can remain at home during their treatment, but we do have an inpatient workload due to treatment related toxicities, complications of underlying malignancies such as spinal cord compression, brain, brain metastasis, and particularly in the geographical region that I work in, frail elderly patients living distant to the centre, they may come in for the duration of their treatment and get home at the weekends. So oncology in general is 
as I said, a team-based um, role. There's a lot of non-clinical roles as well. And I am very fortunate to be involved in both training and education, management, research, and have some external duties. So it was really just to, to give you a flavor. I'm sorry I've rushed through this, but I'm aware there's another talk coming up soon. And I'd be more than happy to answer questions. You can direct message me after this and I'll, I'll give some time to add, um, answer some questions at the end. I do a lot of um, education and treat, teaching um, in my undergraduate role as um, oncology lead, delivering and planning the, the, the education for the, the medical students in oncology. And I'm also a personal tutor, so I'm very privileged to, to meet um, students from first year and mentor them through the whole six years of their of their um, training, get to know them well and offer it sort of um, academic and, and pastoral support for them. In postgraduate um, education, I'm a clinical supervisor, so I see the, 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 the trainees when they come for the four month attachment in breast cancer, but also have a, a role similar to the personal tutor role, where as an educational supervisor, I see them from year one up to the end of their, their training. And also do a lot of work with them, um, allied health professionals, trainee um, ex advanced nurse practitioners, etc. Management is something that's at the heart of oncology about improving clinical services to deliver person-centred, safe, effective, efficient, equitable, timely care. And never has that been more important than at present. Effectively managing the development and performance of staff, both health, um, allied health professionals and, and medical staff. And improving team working both within our own department and across others. And leading and supporting the involvement of patients or improvements in patient information. And, and there's a, a, a um, very simplistic Often the very simplistic things make the biggest difference. We had a medical student recently who looked at the breast cancer patient experiences. Patients were coming to our new patient breast clinical oncology um, clinic and were often frustrated that their expectation of what was going to be achieved in the clinic was different to our expectation of what was going to be achieved. And, and we were just asking a few simple questions. The patients thought their treatment was going to start the day that, the day that we saw them. And by just making a simple um, change to and providing a patient information leaf about the clinic and about their treatment in their appointment letter really improved the patient experience. So it just shows that sometimes the simple things can have the biggest impact. With um, oncology, obviously, research is pivotal to our work. And there's an opportunity to be involved in a wealth of clinical trials, both at local and national level. We do a lot of clinical audit and a lot of quality improvement projects as well. There's a lot of work in the, the external duties. I'm an examiner for the Royal College of Radiologists but also involved in the university, appraisal of new therapies such as the Scottish Medicines Consortium and, and NICE, which is, is it, um, the UK equivalent, and cancer networks. We work um, as a cancer network to ensure equitable distribution and access to, to um, oncology treatment across the regions. So I'm sorry that was a real rush through this. I'm very, very keen to speak to people who are interested in a cure in oncology. I'm very, very passionate about this. Um, I, I just think it's such a diverse day-to-day -day life, no, no day is the same. And if you are interested, what should you do next? Well, the, the College of Radiologists um, have undergraduate oncology bursaries and prizes that you should consider applying to when you're at medical school. Think about choosing a special study module or elective in clinical oncology. Develop your portfolio. Think about clinical or medical audits with an oncology focus and join the Oncology Society. We know that there's a real network of oncology societies throughout um, the UK. Speak to clinical oncologists, speak to me, speak to my colleagues and spend some time finding out how the cancer services work in the UK. I'm just very sorry that um, with the IT issues earlier, I'd be very, very keen to address any questions. So if you want to type questions away to me, I'd be very, very keen to, to speak with you. So I don't know if anyone's got any questions they want to ask me. I'm aware there's only a few minutes left before the next session. But I'd be very happy for you to direct message me as well. From an email address or anything that students or... Uh, yeah, I'm happy to give my... I've, I've got my email address. I'm happy to share it. Do you want me just to type it here? If you could, or, that'd be fantastic. Please, if you just put that in the chat and then people can, yeah. um, can see it. I'm sorry uh, about all the IT issues, but... Um, oh, pop, pop, so... Adjo, you've asked what proportion of my work comprises ward rounds. I am I'm very, I, I do a ward round. We have a consultant of the, the day who does a ward round. So I do a ward round every Thursday. It probably only takes about an hour of my, my day on a Thursday. So my inpatient workload is very, very minimal. The majority of my workload is um, outpatient based, radiotherapy planning, chemotherapy, prescribing, multidisciplinary team meetings and um, 
things. Um, the other thing is about on call. We work in a very, very big team. So my on call, I'm very fortunate. I only, I, my weekend commitment is only three weekends a year. So I'm, I'm very fortunate. I don't have an on call heavy um, specialty, which certainly appeals to me as, as a as a mother of two young children. It definitely it does. What do I like most about being a clinical oncologist? I think what I like most is my patients. I think what I, I probably didn't have the, the, the chance to say was that you get to see patients from, from diagnosis to death. Now, not all my patients obviously die. We have a very high um, cure rate in cancer, but I get to know my patients through the whole course of their treatment. I get to know their families. I see them regularly for, for, for five years of follow-up. And I think it is the patients and also... Um, the team that I work with. I work with such a fantastic team. And if it wasn't for all those team members, it'd be very, very difficult. Malika, you ask about does non-clinical oncology involve surgery? The only surgery per se is brachytherapy, and that's not surgery itself. I just go into theatre to, to, to conduct that. And um, Mariam, you asked what would I do differently if I were to go through medical school and training again? I, I think I've loved every moment of this. I, I was at Edinburgh Medical School and then went on and did a general medical rotation, spent some time in London. I did a clinical fellowship in Melbourne just before I became a consultant. I would certainly I recommend um, stepping out of your comfort zone and going somewhere else to, 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 to learn medicine in a different setting. Work experience of interest in oncology. I don't know if you are you, Violet, I'm not sure if you're a medical student or an aspiring medical student. Um, I would, we've had a lot of um, school students. Um, so yeah, school students have come into oncology and spent some time with us. What I've done when I've organised, I work very closely with quite a lot of the local schools in Edinburgh. What I've done is when I've planned um, work experience, I've, I've ensured you've had a day in oncology, but also a day in GP, a &E, radiology. Um, so I would speak locally. I don't know where you are, Violet. Um, I'm not sure where you're at school and if I can help um, put you in touch with someone. I'll put my email address here so you can email if you want directly. That be How's COVID impacting my ability to find treatment? You probably, I'm just going to type it here. COVID has thankfully not impacted how we deliver treatment in Edinburgh. We have continued as normal. Um, it has impacted patients because our patients have been shielding and in Scotland they've been shielding, and, and they've, they've been shielding since March. The, the shielding has just been lifted in the last few weeks for these patients. How to get involved in research as a medical student, Carola, I would recommend trying to do a special study module with an oncologist. We, we have students come through all the time um, and just reach out to your oncology society if you have one, because they'll be very good at putting you in the direction of, of interested oncologists.